Hello, Free Library patrons. Once again, I am Widener Children's Librarian, Mr. Dan, and today I'm going to be reading Spirit Seeker, John Coltrane's musical journey, written by Gary Golio, with paintings by Rudy Gutierrez. I'm also going to be featuring a track from John Coltrane's album, My Favorite Things, which is also called My Favorite Things. So please enjoy. <laughs> High Point, North Carolina, 1938. A warm light filled the small church. It was Sunday morning. John smiled as his mother pressed the organ keys, calling choir voices to soar through the air above his head. A part of him was soaring too. Closing his eyes, he imagined angels with gleaming brass horns and golden harps, the sounds all swirling together like the colors at sunset. Suddenly, the fiery voice of Reverend Blair made John sit up, his large dark eyes fixed on his grandfather's face. Always full of questions about God, about everything, John took in every word. Preaching from the gospel, the Reverend spoke about the power of the Spirit to guide and heal each human being, no matter what. This was a promise John would never forget. At 12 years old, John had a very sweet life. He lived in the Reverend's two-story house at the top of a hill with Mama and Papa, Grandma Blair, Aunt Betty, and Cousin Mary. John would roller skate down the long paved street with Mary by his side. There were baseball games and hide and seek with friends, but also hours for sitting alone and making model planes, cutting and fitting every tiny piece. At the family feast each week, plates were piled high with fried chicken, hominy, grits, cornbread, collards and John's favorite sweet potato pie. Life was like a little slice of heaven. John's father J.R. ran his own tailor shop. He'd play the ukulele for friends there after work, singing tender ballads in a deep soulful voice. At home, John and Mary liked to sit outside J.R.'s bedroom and listen to him fill the house with songs from his violin. With eyes like an owl, John watched Papa turn feelings into sound. Two weeks before Christmas, Reverend Blair died. He was the head of the family and everyone felt lost without him. Three weeks later, J.R. died of cancer. Now the family was in shock. Mary cried for days, but John was silent. He'd have trouble breathing at night and sometimes forget what Papa looked like. Thoughts about God, life, and death ran through his mind like wildfire, but left him frozen and afraid. He shared his feelings only with Mama. In a gentle voice, she'd remind him to read his Bible and to have faith. That spring, Grandma Blair died. Mary's father, too, would be gone the next year. It seemed like the sweetness of life had vanished forever. Left with no money, Mama and Aunt Betty took jobs at White's only country club in town, where John found work shining shoes. They also rented out the top floor bedrooms of the house to boarders and everyone in the family slept downstairs. Missing Papa, John turned to the radio for music. Big bands were all the rage, but there were only a few famous black band leaders like Duke Ellington and Count Basie. One of John's favorite musicians was Lester Young, who played tenor saxophone with the Count. Lester's sound was bouncy but deep, laughter sprinkled with tears. For John, it was like an echo of Papa's voice. John started high school just as a black pastor in town was rounding up used instruments for a community band. Lessons were held in the basement of the church. Beginning on the alto saxophone, John was the first at practice and the last to leave. Back home, he'd sit at the dining room table by himself, running the notes over and over through his old worn horn. Playing made John come alive now he was filling the house with sound. Mellow love songs or spunky swing music, it didn't matter. Different songs for different moods, Papa would have understood. After joining the high school band, John took his horn everywhere. Music made him happy and it seemed like what he was meant to do with his life. As he listened to Johnny Hodges, a musician in Duke Ellington's band with a sound soft as velvet, John felt the sax becoming more a part of him. He loved the clicking of the keys, the feel of the mouthpiece, 
between his lips and teeth, the shine of the brass, and the way it sat on his chest, close to his heart. As he practiced for hours in the music room, his clear, warm notes floated through the school. Shy and quiet, he let the horn become his voice. In John's last year of high school, Mama left High Point for a better job up north. A few months later, Mary and Aunt Betty went to live with relatives, leaving John at home alone. On a postcard, he wrote to Mary, I sure wish y'all would come home. I miss you. Wrapping himself up in music, he practiced constantly. At Friday night parties with friends, he began drinking alcohol to feel less shy and less lonely. But the loneliness only grew. John even started to wonder if God really was there, watching over him and listening, and he wanted an answer. Out in the backyard, late one night, he raised his horn to the dark, distant sky. Notes went flying upward, shot at the stars as if to say, Look, here I am, trying to light my way with this horn. But the stars were silent. After high school, John left for Philadelphia, a city brimming with jazz and blues. Leaving his borrowed instruments behind, he worked at a sugar factory and lived with his cousin, Mary, and Aunt Betty in a small apartment. When Mama visited one weekend, she brought him a special gift. Finally, a saxophone of his own. Now John reached for the horn first thing in the morning. He began taking classes, studying classical and modern music, always doing more than his teachers asked. After work, he practiced in his room or in a nearby church where each note echoed like a small prayer. Late at night, he'd fall asleep with the saxophone cradled in his arms. John began playing with big bands and small blues groups. At local clubs and concert halls, he and his friends listened to the hottest musicians in jazz. That's when he first heard Charlie Bird Parker. With quick blasts of notes and long, wild solos on the sax, Bird was creating a bold type of jazz called bebop. Filled with jumping beats and playful sounds, it set John's heart racing. He put Bird's picture on the wall of his room and tried to catch the man's spirit in his horn. Like an express train, John was picking up musical styles wherever he went, gaining speed, energy, and rhythm. Friends called him the swinging one. Hired to tour with some well-known bands, he was out on the road for weeks at a time, far from friends and family. Staying in one dark hotel room after another, he found each new city cold and lonely. As a black man, John saw the fear and suspicion in people's eyes when he walked through their towns. The world seemed full of strangers and empty of friends. Sad and tired, John soon stopped going to church or reading the Bible. He drank alcohol with other musicians at clubs and bars where they played. Sometimes he was even told to walk the bar with his sax, parading along the top of the counter like a circus performer, and that only made him feel worse. Now, John Coltrane really had the blues, and they had him too. By age 24, John's devoted playing had earned him respect. Dizzy Gillespie, the high priest of bebop, and Johnny Hodges, John's early hero, each asked him to join their bands for a time. He was searching, learning, stretching himself musically, and these men became his teachers. Around this time, a friend and fellow musician lent John some books about world religions, different ways of thinking about God and life. These were old beliefs and ideas from China, India, Africa, and Japan. But they were new to John. One idea that the human body is a sacred place like a church that must be kept clean, open to the light and air. Reading these books, John felt as if some sunlight and fresh air were entering his own life again. Still, the sadness he'd known for years hung over him. Dark and heavy, like an overcoat, he couldn't take off. He even tried using drugs to take away his painful feelings, to quiet his thoughts and numb his body. But drugs couldn't do that, and John couldn't stop using them. He began falling asleep on stage or showing up late, only to be fired. Part of him stood in the darkness, while another part was searching for the light. Then John met a woman named Naima. Easy to talk to, she also believed that life and the body were sacred. They married and John felt hopeful again. 
When Miles Davis, a brilliant young star of the jazz world, asked John to join his group, it seemed like a fresh start. His playing became faster, bolder, as he experimented with sound itself. He was pushing the saxophone to sing in new and unusual ways, and Miles gave him the freedom to find his own place in that music. But Miles wouldn't let John use drugs. He had quit them himself and told John to do the same. When John couldn't, he lost his job. More than that, he'd lost his way. Moving back to Mama's house in Philadelphia, John saw his world come to a sudden stop. His body was sick and his pockets were empty. Now he had to choose between the dead end of drugs or a life rich with music. Waking one morning, John remembered his grandfather's words, the promise of spirit and of healing. He asked Mama and Naima for help. With nothing to eat and only water to drink, he stayed alone in his room, resting and praying as the drugs slowly left his body. It was painful, but John felt that he was being cleansed, made new again. When he came out a few days later, he was free. And John had been given another gift, a beautiful, mysterious sound, like the heartbeat of the universe itself, that he heard in a dream and would search for the rest of his life. Back on stage, John's playing was clearer, brighter, and more powerful than ever. His spirit was set loose, and it flowed through his hands and mouth like wind filling a sail. Notes poured from his horn at lightning speed, countless drops of rain and a musical storm, with echoes of thunder and the wailing wind. Turning notes upside down and inside out, he ran the scales backward and forward, stretching sound from the lowest lows to the highest highs. Swing, blues, bebop, hot jazz, cool jazz, gospel and classical. Everything John had ever heard was blending together in his mind and heart. It was a heavenly mix of sounds, like what he had imagined years ago, sitting in church as a boy. Now musicians and critics packed the clubs, caught in the spell of his playing. Rejoining Miles' group, John breathed new life into his saxophone feeding it with fresh musical ideas and finding inspiration everywhere. Piled around his bed at home were books on science, psychology, ancient Egypt, African religion, and the sounds of India and China. Thinking that music might be a master key, John searched for clues to unlock the mysteries of life. And the more he read and studied, the more he believed in all religions, one God called by many names, he prayed and waited, offering himself as a servant and messenger. Then, in one big musical leap, John composed the songs for a record called Giant Steps. Full of difficult and exciting new pieces, it brought him success, attention, and the chance to lead his own group. He was finally ready to start preaching with his horn. Like his grandfather before him, John wanted to wake people up and call them to worship. If music could make people laugh, dance, and sing, even bring them to tears, it could open their hearts and minds and bring them closer to God. Now, when he played for hours in concerts and clubs, he was like a man in a trance, a holy man shouting out his love of life to the whole human race. Meditating at home one night, John felt the spirit take hold of him. Later, he would tell Mama of his vision and of the music that came to him. It would become the ultimate expression of his spiritual search a masterpiece, his offering to the Lord. He called the work a love supreme. Opening with a metal gong that shimmers like a church bell, the album brings the saxophone, piano, bass, and drums together in a musical prayer of praise and thanksgiving. It's as if the instruments are playing hide and seek with God and finding him everywhere in every sound and note they make. Through it all, John leads his group of musical explorers with the voice of his horn. Sweet and slow, fiery and fast moving, his saxophone is, at times, the roar of a lion, the laughter of a child, a foghorn cutting through the mists, the song of the human heart reaching up to heaven. There is never an end. There are always new sounds to imagine, new feelings to get at. John Coltrane